Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here, especially our very distinguished witnesses. Thank you for taking the time uh, to prepare your testimonies and for your leadership uh, for many, many years. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations will come to order. Today, the Subcommittee continues to expose the ever-worsening, pervasive, malign influence of the Chinese Communist Party at the United Nations. The Chinese Communist Party is an unelected, highly deceptive and unimaginably cruel political entity, a dictatorship that rules by force, torture, and coercion, and stands credibly accused of genocide and a plethora of human rights abuses. The CCP is not a benign rival to the United States or other free nations, but poses an existential threat to its neighbors in the region and a serious military threat to the United States. The CCP does not just seek to dominate the international rules-based order, uh, it seeks to replace it. That's why, for example, I strongly oppose the PRC's ascension into the World Trade Organization with my vote in the House, this is two decades ago, and I chaired several hearings, including one in 1999, which I called China Human Rights in the WTO. And in 2011, 10 years in the WTO has China kept its promises. The record is clear and um, ominous. The CCP absolutely does not keep its promises to respect the innate dignity of all people, and to this day works to subvert and fundamentally undermine all respect for human rights. Under Xi Jinping, the CCP has mastered the art of subverting the international rule -based, rules-based order through its involvement at the UN. And I am deeply concerned that the Biden administration is not taking sufficient action to stop it. Let me start by reminding everyone that the United States played the leading role in founding of the United Nations in the aftermath of World War II, and remains by far the largest financial contributor to the UN system. It is true that China's assessed contributions have risen to the second highest rate, 15%, compared to the US rate of 22%, yet China lags far behind the United States in funding to the UN. In 2022, for example, the US contributed, <clears throat> pardon me, approximately $18 billion to the UN system, more than eight times the amount that China contributed. Moreover, only about three billion of this was assessed contributions. The US paid 90 times more than China in voluntary contributions to the UN in 2022. China's voluntary contributions were only $164 million. And yet, where is the acknowledgement for this extraordinary generosity? Why does the United States so often fail to yield commensurate influence within the UN system? Ambassador Bremberg and Ambassador Curie, I want to thank you especially for your previous service representing the United Nations at the United Nations and for being here today. And Suzanne uh, Nazel, welcome to you as well. Uh, we look forward to hearing your reflections on these matters from your personal experience of the CCP's corrupting influence in the UN system. Even though China's financial contributions to the UN remain comparatively small, the CCP has become adept at manipulating the UN system for its own advantage. The CCP blatantly uses this position on the UN Human Rights Council to shield itself from criticism and to avoid accountability for its horrific human rights abuses. I was appalled when former High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, caved the CCP demands to water down her report on Xinjiang. Instead of rightly declaring these atrocities a genocide, she pulled punches and delayed the release of the report literally until the 11th hour publishing the document minutes before her term expired. And when the United States proposed a resolution to merely debate the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang, it was voted down <clears throat> at the Human Rights Council because the CCP lobbied effectively against it. In a February hearing of the Commission, uh, Congressional Executive Commission on China, which I chaired, Dr. Rana Sio Inboden of the University of Texas at Austin testified that, and I quote, China's actions over the last decade show that the PRC has become intent on using its presence in the UN to alter international human rights norms and rewire the system in ways that will make it easier for states to escape scrutiny of their human rights records, close quote. This includes manipulating the universal periodic review process, which they did uh, very effectively, sadly, where the CCP pressured developing countries and fellow authoritarian regimes to speak in its favor and help obscure its abysmal human rights record. They crowded out uh, comments by other nations 
by filling up the roster with people who are just uh, uh, paying lip service and kowtowing to China. As I said at the hearing just in February, the truth is that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party constitute a systemic challenge to the international rules-based order and reject the very concept of universal human rights. The obstruction of truth during the latest UPR is just another example of the CCP's long and brutal campaign to silence its critics. As we've heard from previous witnesses, Hillel Noor of UN Watch, for example, staff at the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, were pressured to share names of dissidents, including Uyghurs, who planned to come to the United Human Rights Council. And they did share these names routinely with the CCP, who then used the information to intimidate these human rights activists as well as their families. It is despicable that even when this was exposed by courageous whistleblowers, including Emma Riley, she was punished by the UN for revealing the truth. The CCP also pressures Chinese nationals in UN leadership positions to prioritize party interests over the obligation to the UN Charter. When Wu Hongbu uh, was head of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, he admitted to acting in China's interests at the UN, including throwing Xi Jinping, uh, Xinjiang human rights supporters out of UN buildings. This abuse of power is not unique. We saw Fang Liu, when she was head of the International Civil Aviation Organization, attempt to cover up a serious data breach that was linked to Chinese state-affiliated hackers. And when Chinese nationals do attempt to carry out leadership duties without doing Xi Jinping's bidding, they are summarily punished, as in the case of Ming Hong Wei, the first Chinese head of Interpol, who was detained in 2018 and sentenced uh, to 13 years in jail. The charges against him were allegedly part of an anti-corruption campaign, or more likely a purge of Xi Jinping's political rivals. And his wife has been left with no information whatsoever about his whereabouts. Where is Meng Hung Wei now? Will he ever get justice? CCP pressure extends not just to Chinese nationals, but to CCC preferred candidates from other nations. We have seen the World Health Organization Director General Tedros, who the CCP supported, bend to Xi Jinping's influence, especially uh, when the WHO parroted the CCP talking points in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tragically, this malign influence allowed the CCP to avoid accountability and conceal important information that could have saved lives. Right now, with a pandemic treaty is being negotiated at WHO, and of course, the text includes nothing that would hold the CCP accountable for its role in COVID-19 origins. Uh, WHO are both important standard-setting bodies, and the CCP has deliberately excluded uh, Taiwan from these and many other international organizations. Even though Taiwan has displayed exemplary public health practices and remains a major air traffic hub, Taiwanese delegations are denied a voice at these venues due to pressure from the CCP. This is an especially important issue to highlight today on the 45th anniversary of the Taiwan's Relations Act becoming United States law. The CTP twists UN Resolution 2758, which allowed the Communist PRC government to become a UN member, to claim that the international community recognizes the PRC sovereignty over Taiwan. This that document does not address, however, Taiwan's sovereignty, however, and should never be used as an excuse to exclude Taiwan from merely participating in international organizations and the U.S. must do more to support Taiwan's participation. As we all know, there's a very strong bipartisan support for this, but it has not yielded the fruit that we all hope for. The U.S. also must do more to promote American candidates and those of partners and allies in key leadership elections. The State Department has promoted successful campaigns to place U.S. and partner country citizens in some key positions over the past years, sometimes ousting CCP preferred candidates. For example, Doreen Bogdan Martin, an American, was successfully elected Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union in 2022. She replaced a PRC national in, the, in that important standards setting body and defeated a Russian CC back candidate in the election. The US was also, also waged a successful effort to support a Singaporean national as head of the World Intellectual Property Organization in 2020, defeating the PRC candidate. But overall, this effort could be more strategically coordinated 
to ensure that our partners and allies are on board and that we are targeting the most important posts which could otherwise be manipulated by the CCP. While the CCP malign influence at the UN is getting worse, the UN has a window of opportunity to counter this influence and preserve the rules-based order. But we must act now and be more outspoken about the threat that the Chinese Communist Party poses within the multilateral system. I would like to now yield to my good friend, Dr. Burra, uh, for any opening comments you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for, for being here as well. This hearing is a critical opportunity to reflect on the best way to ensure that the United States and democratic allies are advancing our values and interests across the United Nations and other international organizations. Advancing our interests and ideals by engaging robustly in the UN system is one of the most effective ways to ensure that the United States is shaping global norms around human rights, climate change, emerging technologies, and other global challenges. U.S. engagement at the UN also helps support our allies and partners, including Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, but only when we're at the table and forming a united bloc. What we saw in the previous administration was a retreat from the UN system. We saw disengagement from the UN, US funding cuts, and withdrawal from UN bodies, including UNESCO and UNHRC. The United Nations or the United States accrued over one billion in arrears for failing to meet our financial obligations. Adversaries like the PRC and Russia use the resulting leadership vacuum to roll back advances in global human rights, including by covering up human rights abuses against the Uyghur people and in Ukraine. For the first time at the UN, we saw PRC nationals head the most UN specialized agencies helping to propel the PRC's malign influence. That experience made clear that engagement and coordination are the answer, not retreat and isolation. By contrast, the current administration's strategy is yielding clear results. In 2022, through efforts led by Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield in the United States General Assembly, member states elected a U.S. national to lead the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, which is responsible for promoting access to digital technologies, replacing a PRC national. As of this year, a P PRC nationals head only one UN specialized agency, while US nationals head three of the most important US agencies, UN agencies, the World Food Program, UNICEF, and the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. And many of our allies and partners oversee peacekeeping, international finance, and humanitarian relief. The United Nations rejoined UNESCO and UNHRC and alongside like-minded allies and partners is once again leading multilateral efforts to reassert the importance of global human rights norms and fact-finding missions and push back against harmful PRC resolutions across these and other UN fora. We should continue to work to build on the progress that our country is making. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Jacobs? Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, having formerly worked at the United Nations, I know how important it is, and I also know how important U.S. leadership is. That's why I've been so forceful in pushing to make sure that the U.S. pays all of our dues uh, and doesn't incur arrears, um, because we know that actually those arrears and the debts uh, are a big part of what we've seen the Chinese use uh, in order to push forward their proposals. So, for instance, uh, a, a recent uh, report from National Defense University um, showed that the Chinese used the fact that we were in arrears to peacekeeping um, uh, to push for the elimination of human rights staff positions within peacekeeping missions. Um, uh, we've also seen how uh, U.S. non-engagement at UNESCO has allowed the Chinese to become the biggest uh, uh, funder of UNESCO and therefore push uh, for greater influence there. Uh, so, you know, to me, the most important thing we can be doing to counter PRC influence at the UN is make sure that the U.S. is showing up fully uh, and fully paying our dues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield Thank back. you, Ms. Jacobs. I'd like to now introduce our very distinguished panel, beginning first with Ambassador Andrew Bremberg, 
who is the President Emeritus of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. He served as ambassador, uh, as the representative of the United States to the Office of the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. Ambassador Bremberg has a long history of public service. Prior to his work at the UN, he served as assistant to the president and director of the Domestic Policy Council for the Executive Office of the President. He previously served as policy advisor and counsel uh, nominations for the Office of the Senate Majority Leader. And he also worked on the nonprofit, uh, for the nonprofit MITRE Corporation as a senior health policy analyst and department manager and for the US Department of Health and Human Services. Ambassador uh, Bremberg earned his BA from the Franciscan University in Steubenville in Ohio and his JD from Catholic University of America in Washington. He and his wife Maria have four children and live in Virginia. We'll then hear from Ambassador Kelly Curry, who is a founding partner of Kylo Alpha Strategies, a boutique geopolitical advisory firm. Throughout her career in foreign policy, Ambassador Curry has specialized in human rights, political reform, and non-traditional security issues with a focus on the Indo-Pacific region. Ambassador Curie is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council with a joint affiliation to the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and the Freedom and Prosperity Center. She also serves on the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy, the board of governors of the East-West Center, and advisory boards of Spirit of America, the Vandenberg Coalition, and the Global Taiwan Institute. Ambassador Curry was unanimously confirmed in July of 2017 uh, as um, the United States uh, representative to the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, and alternate representative to the UN General Assembly under Ambassador Nikki Haley. She subsequently was appointed interim senior official in the Department of State's Office of Global Criminal Justice and confirmed as ambassador at large for global women's issues and the US representative at the United Nations Commission for the Status of Women uh, from 2009 until her appointment to the uh, US UN leadership. She was senior fellow uh, with the Project 2049 Institute, where she founded and directed the Institute's Burma Transition Initiative. From 2021 to 2023, Ambassador Curry was an adjunct senior fellow with the Center for New American Societies and the Pacific Security Project. She has held additional senior policy positions within the Department of State, U.S. Congress, international organizations, uh, and non-governmental organizations. Her writings appear regularly in the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, Just Security, and Fox News. She received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center with a focus of international human rights law and an undergraduate uh, degree cum laude in political science from the University of Georgia's School of Public and International Affairs. And thirdly, we will hear from Suzanne uh, Nuzzle, is that correct? Uh, Chief Executive Order at PEN America and author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. Prior to joining PEN America, she served as the Chief Operating Officer of Human Rights Watch and as Executive Director of Amnesty International USA. She has served in the Obama administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, leading US engagement in the UN and multilateral institutions on human rights issues and in the Clinton administration as deputy to the U.S. Ambassador for U.N. Management and Reform. Ms. Nossel uh, 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 coined the term smart power, which was the title of the 2004 article she published in Foreign Affairs magazine and later became the theme of Secretary uh, Clinton's tenure in office. She is a featured columnist for Foreign Policy magazine, writes for Foreign Affairs, and has published op eds in the New York Times, The Post, and LA Times as well as scholarly articles in foreign affairs, dissent, and democracy, among others. She's a member of the Oversight Board, uh, an international body that oversees content moderation on social media. She's a former senior fellow at the Century Foundation, uh, the Center for American Progress, and the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she is magna cum laude graduate of both Harvard and Harvard Law School. Uh, thank you. And Ambassador Bremberg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Smith uh, and members of the committee. I'd like to ask that my written statement be submitted as part of the record. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding the influence of the Chinese Communist Party in the United Nations. Over the last decade, the CCP has grown increasingly assertive in its engagements at the UN. What was once a defensive snapping turtle posture has been replaced with Xi Jinping's wolf warrior foreign policy. As the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. in Geneva, I saw firsthand how China sought to bend international norms 
to fit Beijing's malign interest. The COVID-19 pandemic showed the world firsthand the consequences of China's influence at the UN. China clearly failed to live up to its obligations under, under the international health regulations. China's reluctance and refusal to share critical data about the virus, including its transmissibility, and live virus samples harmed the global response. Shockingly, through all of this, the WHO failed to hold China accountable for its lack of transparency. At the time when we needed it the most, the WHO's communications and actions were influenced by political considerations rather than grounded in public health and the need for impartial dissemination of information. Almost 20 years earlier, the CCP had been publicly criticized by the WHO for its failure to be transparent about a novel coronavirus outbreak, now known as SARS. The, this resulted in significant reforms to the IHRs to ensure that countries would be transparent about novel infectious diseases. Surely this time, after the experience of SARS and the strengthening of the IHRs, the WHO leadership would insist on transparency. From all of my meetings and calls with the WHO Director General and his staff, we knew the WHO was asking the right questions in private about getting a team on the ground immediately to investigate, about getting more information on transmissibility, about tailored travel restrictions, and about access to live virus samples. But not once did the WHO or its leadership publicly share how those questions were either rejected, ignored, or given delayed or very partial answers by China. What had changed in 20 years? While the world had strengthened the rules, the CCP had strengthened its relationships in the WHO to ensure it would not be criticized. One of China's other high profile leadership roles in the UN was the Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union. During his time of service, significant concerns were raised about how China used this position to promote a more authoritarian model of internet governance, which emphasizes state sovereignty over the internet and tight controls over cyberspace reminiscent of Beijing's Great Firewall. We saw China influence the development and adoption of global technical standards for telecommunications and information technologies, including standards advancing surveillance and censorship. China also leveraged its influence to favor domestic companies such as Huawei in the global market. Fortunately, in 2018, the U.S. put forward a senior administration, a senior American candidate to run for deputy secretary general of the ITU. And after winning, she was later elected as the new secretary general in 2022. In 2020, the World Intellectual Property Organization held a director general election and a Chinese national was the assumed favorite. WIPO is an important specialized agency responsible for promoting protection of intellectual property worldwide. I doubt I need to explain to anyone here why there were serious concerns about China winning the leadership position of a critically important IP body. In response, the US led a coalition of countries to push back against China's campaign, and a new director general was elected in the most lopsided victory in WIPO's history. This was widely viewed as a significant moment in the politics of international organizations, demonstrating the ability of a coalition of countries to finally push back against China's increasing influence in global governance and paved the way for the US to secure the leadership position at the ITU in 2022. While it is clear the US has started to halt China's march at the UN, we are still failing to address the terrible human rights abuses currently taking place. China aggressively combats criticism of its human rights record, leveraging its diplomatic network and economic influence to discourage criticism or dilute condemnations at the Human Rights Council or other fora. It has proactively organized support for statements and resolutions backing its policies in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, effectively using the UN system to legitimize its worst human rights, rights violations. In 2022, the Victims of Communism Foundation published a massive trove of hacked documents and images from Beijing's de facto concentration camps in Xinjiang. It included not only photos of detainees, but internal police documents detailing the methods of detention, including unmistakable phrases like, shoot first, report later. A and also private speech transcripts in which senior communist officials called for detaining Uyghurs en masse, 
while highlighting the direct involvement of Xi Jinping and other senior CCP officials in the genocidal campaign. Thankfully, these files were repeatedly referenced and included in the Office of the UN High Commissioner's August 2022 report, which was much delayed, but did conclude that the CCP's actions may constitute crimes against humanity. It is shameful that this report has never been discussed at a meeting of the Human Rights Council. While the US did attempt to add this to the HRC agenda in October of 2022, this effort failed by two votes. What I find even more shameful as an American is the fact that the US has made no attempt since to get this report on any agenda. I would also note that in 2022, China ratified two international labor organization conventions related to forced labor. The US can use these ratifications as a leverage point to push for stringent enforcement and monitoring mechanisms within the ILO to ensure that China fully complies with these conventions. Unfortunately, I am not aware of any actions the US taken in this regard. To conclude, if the US is going to participate in a UN body, we must take a proactive approach. We should work to shape the agendas and seek leadership positions or actively promote candidates from like-minded countries. The US can work closely with our allies to coordinate positions and voting strategies and jointly push for reforms in UN institutions that ensure trans transparency and accountability. And the US must continue to champion human rights and hold China, as well as those countries that defend it, accountable for their human rights violations. Thank you again for holding this very important hearing and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so very much, Ambassador Rimberg. Ambassador Kerry. Uh, Chairman Smith and distinguished committee members, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm here in my personal capacity, and I ask that my full statement be included for the record. Well, without objection, all of your statements will be included uh, in the record and any extraneous material you would like to add. Thank you. Um, as the United States contributes approximately $18 billion a year to the United Nations, its value proposition for the American people increasingly comes down to whether the UN remains an effective tool to address global challenges and to what degree China and the CCP are using these institutions to expand their own power and influence at our expense. Today's hearing is focused on the second issue, but these questions are heavily intertwined for us and for the UN. In a 2023 speech, uh, EU, Commissioner, uh, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen put it very well. The Chinese Communist Party's clear goal is a systemic change of the international order with China at its center. We have seen it with China's positions in multilateral bodies which show its determination to promote an alternative vision of the world order. One where individual rights are subordinated to national security, where security and economy take prominence over political and civil rights." End quote. Nowhere is this new vision more deeply felt than in China's approach to the United Nations system. Xi Jinping has serious ambitions to rewire the post-World War II global architecture and bend it to accommodate CCP rule. Xi Jinping thought is rooted in deeply authoritarian concepts that run counter to the normative framework of the United Nations Charter, the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and other pillars of the UN. But at the UN, China gets away with claiming that these same thoughts are integral to achieving the sustainable development goals. How is this possible? China's win-win strategy starts with seeking maximum value for minimum cash. As Chairman Smith noted, China pays the second largest assessed contribution, but only provides 0.5 of the voluntary funds that pay for two-thirds of UN activities, while the United States provides around 30% of those voluntary funds but China manages to get quite a lot for their 0.5%. Take the UN Peace and Development Fund, for instance. I'll talk about how it started. In 2015, Xi Jinping personally announced a $1 billion contribution to support the newly minted SDGs in, a very big in his big speech at the General Assembly during High Level Week. How it's going? Well, the actual funding is around $20 million a year, and the money is split between the Secretary General's Executive Office and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. DESA, which is le led by a Chinese national and former CCP official, uses half of that money to integrate the Belt and Road into the SDGs. That's literally the goal of the project. 
The other half is essentially a slush fund for pet projects that the Secretary General can't get funded through the regular budget. No UN member state body has any oversight of any of these funds. Beijing also seeks out, as, you've bo as both Andrew and um, Chairman Smith have uh, mentioned, Beijing also seeks out leadership positions in key UN bodies, such as Interpol and ICAO and the Food and Agriculture Organization. They use bribery to win these elections, and then the agency heads pursue their national, Chinese national interests in violation of their oath of office under the UN Charter. They also win with, with unelected UN officials as well, such as High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet. She was co-opted into undermining her own office's investigation into the Uyghur genocide, as Chairman Smith noted, and took a highly criticized trip to China where she was seen beatifically gazing at Xi Jinping as he delivered a video taped lecture to her on human rights. It was a stunning moment that undermined the entire object and purpose of the Office of the High Commissioner. She's not alone, however. The Undersecretary General for Counterterrorism, Vladimir Voronkov, also whitewashed China's crimes in the Uyghur region with his controversial 2019 trip to China, where he gave a, a press conference at the end that made no mention of the fact that China was instrumentalizing um, counterterrorism laws to uh, imprison more than a million Uyghurs. Bachelet and Voronkov were only following in their boss's lead, however. Secretary General Guterres maintains a studied silence on China's abuses while praising Xi Jinping's leadership. So much winning for China. When co-optation fails, Beijing resorts to coercion. China's a leader in reprisals against human rights defenders, regularly harassing civil society representatives by blocking their access and shouting them down in UN forums. When I was at USUN, we had an issue where Dolkin Issa, the head of the World Uyghur Congress, attempted to enter UN headquarters for a forum. He was sponsored by a German NGO called the Society for Threatened Peoples. We had to go all the way up to the Secretary General in order to get Dolkin Issa admitted into the UN headquarters. And at one point, I was told that the Chinese permanent representative was calling the Secretary General every day and screaming at him on the phone so loudly that his voice could be heard in the outer offices. When that effort failed, China tried to revoke the consultative status of Society for Threatened Peoples in the NGO committee. Fortunately, we were able to defeat them, but these are the kinds of tactics, the, the extreme lengths that China will go to to stop one human rights defender from entering the United Nations. As Andrew mentioned, even after flagrantly violating international health regulations during the COVID pandemic and causing massive global harm, China has suffered no meaningful loss of access or influence at the UN. Why is this? Well, on top of the UN Secretariat's pro-authoritarian bias, the UN membership consists heavily of authoritarians and authoritarian wannabes who support China. Members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation provide valuable cover on the Uyghur issue, and many other G77 developing countries are big fans of China's norm-bending efforts. And it's not just authoritarian states, unfortunately. When the PRC started sliding Xi Jinping thought into UN resolutions, many democracies were clueless or even saw this as a benign engagement by China. When China introduced its resolution on win-win cooperation in the field of human rights, the United States was the only Human Rights Council member to oppose it. 17 other countries abstained, including Australia, Germany, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. And Xi Jinping thought is now enshrined in the human rights lexicon, largely because of the apathy and ignorance of democratic countries. Since 2019, these tactics have faced some headwinds due to China's increasing aggressiveness and the concerted effort by the United States to push back on their assault and the normative framework. But so much remains to be done. I have a lot of specific recommendations that are included in my written testimony. I'm happy to talk about those during the question and answer period. But Overall, I recommend that we take a back-to-basics approach to the United Nations that focuses on greater transparency and accountability. Well-intentioned supporters of the United Nations need to acknowledge how UN overreach contributes to China's success, including by expanding the to-do list of a system that's struggling with its core tasks. The pro-rights coalition inside the UN must also be more hard-headed in using our own influence to realign the current terrible incentive structures even when it makes us uncomfortable. This doesn't mean that we lower ourselves to Beijing's tactics, but it does mean a willingness to stand and fight for the things that we hold important. 
For decades, the United States advocated bringing the CCP regime into this system and helped inflate this bubble of exceptionalism that has developed around their con conduct in the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and other international and multilateral fora. As a result, we are obliged to lead in retrenching this system and strengthening its resilience against Beijing's unrelenting assault. I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before Ambassador you today. Kerry, thank you again very much for your testimony and your leadership. Um, I, um, I was asking unanimous consent that the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Murphy, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing. Without objection, it is so ordered. I'd like to now turn the floor to Ms. Nassau. Chairman Smith and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the growing influence of China at the United Nations. I'm speaking today in my personal capacity as a former U.S. government official. In the late 1970s, as Deng Xiaoping assumed the reins of power in Beijing, he delivered a message that would become the bedrock of Chinese foreign policy for a generation. Hide our capacities and bide our time. For decades, Chinese diplomats adhered to this dictum at the United Nations. But under the leadership of Xi Jinping, China has dramatically transformed its involvement with the world body, increasingly asserting its newfound clout. On the tactical side, this is most visible in the increased voluntary contributions to a range of UN funds and programs and continuing efforts to insert Chinese personnel into key positions of influence throughout the system. But more subtly and strategically, Beijing is using its sway within the world body to blunt criticism, shut out and stigmatize Taiwan, plug its Belt and Road Initiative, and dilute norms that might be used to hold it accountable. As a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Organizations and Deputy to the UN, US Ambassador to the UN for UN Management and Reform, I once viewed China's engagement with UN with leery optimism. Today, I view China's growing weight at the UN as a challenge to be met. The UN has become a key test for Beijing's global leadership ambitions, and it is not a stage China will surrender lightly. Rather than ceding ground, the U.S. should meet China at full strength on this global proving ground, leveraging its own potent principles, capabilities, and alliances to compete across four pivotal spheres of influence. China's rise at the U.N. has been fueled in large part by strategic deployment of its growing economic might. In 2019, the PRC surpassed Japan to become the second largest contributor to the U.N.'s regular budget, behind only the U.S. China's embraced the strategic and practical value of voluntary U.N. funding. Most prominent example is the much touted $200 million contribution to the UN Peace and Development Trust Fund. The fund's steering committee is comprised mostly of PRC officials. According to an analysis by the Sydney-based Lowy Institute, more than a third of the projects approved since 2018 have directly supported the Belt and Road Initiative. In meeting its financial obligations and highlighting Washington's failure to consistently do so, Beijing also aims to burnish its image as a dependable and committed global partner that contrasts with a mercurial Washington. Beyond funding, China has been making a concerted effort to secure both executive leadership, UN posts, and quietly influential positions that have significant sway over international standards and enforcement. These include the International Telecommunications Union, which plays a vital role in internet governance and is a setting in which China sought to advance its vision of digital authoritarianism. More recently, China has begun to flex its mus personnel muscles at the center of the UN's peace and security work. The PRC has long deployed more UN peacekeepers than the other five P5 members combined and is now leveraging its skin in the game to fill coveted peacekeeping-related posts. Increasingly, these UN deployments allow the PLA soldiers a chance to gain valuable operational experience in foreign settings. Over the last decade, China has become a far more assertive Security Council presence, joining with Russia to veto resolutions on Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, North Korea, and most frequently, Syria. These vetoes denied UN in interventions to safeguard human rights and prevent government abuses. China's actions on the Security Council reflect an evolving relationship between Beijing, Moscow, and a newfound axis of disruptors that also includes Tehran and Pyongyang. These four capitals have found common cause in championing the primacy of national sovereignty, minimizing the importance of human rights standards, and frustrating American interests. The PRC is also asserting itself as a key actor within the UN's human rights bodies. They follow a two-pronged strategy to, one, block international criticism of Beijing's own repressive human rights record, and two, 
promote orthodox interpretations of national sovereignty and non-interference in internal affairs that weaken international norms of transparency and accountability. The PRC has also consistently used its seat on the UN Committee on Non-Governmental Organizations to block applications from organizations seeking UN consultative status. China links these rejections to explicit endorsements of its One China policy, forcing organizations to recognize Tibet and Taiwan as integral parts of Chinese territory. In so doing, China's created a structural bulwark that shrinks the space for human rights and other civil society voices. These shifts in Chinese engagement with the UN come at a moment when US participation in the global body has been in flux. The US has vacillated between retreating from the UN and punishing its arms through withdrawals and the withholding of contributions and efforts to restore relations and rebuild influence after deliberately fraying ties. This repeated decades long cycle of engagement and retrenchment has exacted a steep diplomatic cost and this vacuum has enabled China's growing power at the UN. China recognizes the latent power of the UN as a force multiplier for its interests around the world. We must do so as well. When the US engages at the UN, its impact and influence are unmatched and constitute a potent tool in service of American interests. When we withdraw and equivocate, we defeat those interests. In concrete terms, first, the US should meet its financial obligations and settle its arrears, eliminating these issues as sticking points for US engagement and denying critics fodder for questioning Washington's commitment and reliability. 25 years ago, early in my career in government, I worked to secure a UN agreement to lower US dues to the world body in return for settling a large arrears that had accumulated. At the time, we thought it was a major breakthrough that would pave the way for consistent US engagement and take away a cudgel that was being used to criticize us in a whole range of negotiations. The fact that this issue remains unsettled uh, uh, you know, two and a half decades later is, to me, a, a huge own goal on the part of the United States. The ongoing machinations over payments and arrears are not a point of leverage or principle, but rather just a reputational hit and a distraction from the vital work of addressing rising authoritarian influence in the multilateral realm. Second, the US should be intentionally creating and overseeing pipelines of personnel who can climb through the UN's ranks and assume position, senior positions over time. It should also install well-qualified Americans drawn from the civil and foreign service, as well as from civil society into key roles. Third, the US needs to empower its diplomats by staffing multilateral roles with seasoned top-level officers and elevating these officers and their priorities within the bureaucracy. Finally, the US should seize the initiative in shaping the UN for the future, offering concrete proposal, proposals to advance long-demanded reforms. These include reforms of the UN's NGO committee and a much-needed new human rights mechanism to track, monitor, and push back against transnational repression. I have more recommendations in my written testimony. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so very much for your testimony. Uh, let me start off with uh, Ambassador Brimmer. Maybe you could speak to something that is very, very disconcerting to me. Um, you know, I have raised human rights issues in China for 44 years. From the moment I got to this place, I was raising religious freedom issues, and that was long before Tiananmen Square. And, and I was shocked, frankly. I also raised repeatedly the forced abortion policy, which was the most egregious violation of women's and children's rights ever, uh, where ch women, who, if they wanted to have a second child, uh, even their first, had to be told uh, that they got a birth allowed certificate from the Chinese Communist Party to do so. Um, and so it, you know, there's been, unfortunately, a terrible, terrible, going back to Mao Zedong, uh, uh, record of human rights abuse of every kind. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, why so many of the countries, and uh, Ambassador Curie, you mentioned uh, some of our, our closest allies who have taken a walk on China. Is it the trade issue? You know, let's not forget uh, that, you know, we bungled the trade issue as well. Uh, I remember when President Clinton linked human rights with most favored nation status for China. I couldn't have been happier. Uh, I gave press conferences, spoke on it repeatedly, that he had taken a really principled stand. Uh, I was joined by, by uh, Speaker Pelosi, not Speaker then, but she was a very effective member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Approach Committee. And, and um, 
we, we were joined in, in saying, yes, this is what needed to be done. Use that leverage, that economic leverage, to try uh, to spur pro, uh, you know, pro-human rights uh, protections. To my shock and dismay, on May 26, 30 years ago, May 26, 1994, Bill Clinton delinked human rights from trade. And, and just so you know, I went over and I met with people in the foreign ministry about midway through the review period after he linked them. Uh, and I was told by the foreign ministry, there's no way uh, uh, they're not going to get MFA. Uh, who are we to be raising human rights issues with the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, and I said, well, what about South Africa? I was for apartheid sanctions. Uh, are you just like them? You say it's a sovereignty issue? Uh, he had no answer to that one, and then he defaulted and said, well, we're getting it. <laughs> I came back and called up Warren Christopher. I talked to his staff, not him. And I said, please, they think we're bluffing. Turns out we were bluffing. And on May 26, 1994, we delinked human rights from trade, and I believe in my heart of hearts that's when we lost China because there would have been serious efforts to try to ameliorate some of their worst human rights abuses, but that never happened uh, because they got their trade. Fast forward to today, why are these countries taking a walk the way they do? Uh, you know, the OIC, I've met with many ambassadors uh, about why the Muslim countries are not more proactive uh, when it comes to um, the slaughter, the genocide against, against um, Muslim Uyghurs. And uh, I've had multiple hearings on it. And uh, I even, you know, after we got our bill passed on, on forced organ harvesting a year ago in March, uh, the Chinese embassy went all out saying it's all lies and there's no forced organ harvesting, even though the evidence is overwhelming. Just did another hearing on it two weeks ago. Uh, it was just, it's horrible. Uh, but they also said, anybody who wants to come to Xinjiang, you're welcome to come. I immediately sent over a letter, said I'd like to lead a bipartisan congressional delegation to Xinjiang. Uh, you said you've got nothing to hide. Well, you're hiding, but let me come in. Let me bring a group of Republicans and Democrats in, uh, and even executive branch people who would want to join us on the CSEE. Um, I've written that letter how many times now <laughs> in follow-up? Nothing. Crickets coming from the Chinese embassy. Uh, they get away with murder, literally. Is it all about the trade? Uh, uh, people can't be persuaded. You know, you know why North Korea, North Korea Iran, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, why all of those countries' governments would do this, but not the democracies. Maybe you could shed some light on that because it's, it's tragic beyond words. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Smith. And at the outset, I want to thank you again for your more than 40 years of heroic leadership on this issue. Um, your, your, your intro and, and discussion just now of the 30-year mistake um, is, is exactly right. Um, I, unlike you, was not around at the time, so I don't remember all of those issues. I wasn't working on this at the time. But I look at it through the lens of while those were mistakes made in the past, we are not bound by history to repeat or keep making the same mistake. Every day, we have a new opportunity to change directions um, for U.S. policy. And I think the U.S. is in the process of doing that. We, we've seen both over the last administration and this administration a, a beginning of a change in recognition of that issue. Um, in working with other Western or d democratic countries, um, during my experience at Geneva, that was one of the most shocking aspects, was that in speaking with my colleagues, um, they were incredibly obtuse to the notion that somehow the Chinese Communist Party was not a force for good, uh, was not a good partner, and that in fact they were a, a wonderful partner to work with in multilateral settings. It was actually the opposite of my conversations with many OIC ambassadors, um, who I remember many occasions where I was going to demarch uh, an, an OIC ambassador about the exact Xinjiang issue. Um, in private, uh, this individual st stopped me immediately out of the gate and said, don't talk to me about this. I've been to Xinjiang. I took the Temkin Village tour, and I know what they're doing there. And it's your fault. That, that hurt. <laughs> um, I, I, I was prepared by my State Department staff to present them the evidence to, to explain what was going on in Xinjiang. No one had even focused or realized that these countries know what's happening, Mr. Chairman. And it's not that they don't care they feel economically influenced and at peril by the CCP, and they don't know where the United States stands. Um, a, a different ambassador said, in expressing great frustration, pointing to you, you know, the United States, 
you created this dragon. We're the ones that have to run from it. That was a shocking quote to hear from, from an ambassador. Um, as, as you're saying in your question, though, why don't the democratic countries get this? And in my experience, um, I, I think they're starting to finally. And unfortunately, I think it's taken the invasion of Russia and Ukraine to help wake them up. Uh, and I would have many conversations with uh, Western ambassadors who were eager for the U.S. to rejoin the Human Rights Council. And I, had, having been a new ambassador, having come from the, the White House, said, I'd love to engage you on how the U.S. can rejoin the Human Rights Council on needed reforms. You know, what, what, well, what are you willing to do? And I was shocked at the sense that, for them, the Human Rights Council took on a value because it was a mechanism, not out of the value of the work that it was supposed to do. And the fact that if, if the council met three times a year and achieved nothing, that was a good in of itself, whereas I found that ridiculous. And that the point of the council had to be to stand for human rights, and that in instances where the world, under the UN auspices, gets together to talk about human rights and fails to do so, that's actually worse than doing nothing. You're actually creating this impression of global human rights consciousness and saying that the atrocities taking place in China are okay. And that's a huge mistake. And I, I'll, I'll close, sorry for going long, I'll just close with, um, I think the invasion in Russia has woken them up a little bit. There was a huge complacency among my um, colleagues to think that you know there aren't good guys and bad guys in this world. There's just diplomats that are all here meeting. And as long as we're meeting, there won't be war. And they were wrong. And I think they've started to learn this now. And I think they've recognized whether it's not just right. Clearly Russia, but especially the CCP, um, they're not at this for kind of um, benign reasons. Yes, Ambassador Curie. Um, my, my experience mirrors that of Andrew's. I think that one of the challenges is that you have people who come into the UN system who are experts in multilateralism. They don't know anything about Chinese politics. They don't know anything about the CCP. And I remember having to very patiently over and over and over again explain to our allies, our closest allies, and this was back in 2017, what the basis of Xi Jinping thought was, why it was not a great idea to include win-win cooperation and shared future of humanity for all mankind language into UN resolutions, why this was, a, in fact, a terrible idea and that this language represented a assault on the normative framework of the United Nations. They genuinely did not understand what I was talking about. And so I think that 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 was a big piece of the problem to begin with was it part of it was this you know kumbaya kind of approach that everybody tends to, to take to the united nations especially from the western democracies um and this kind of assumption that the un is doing good things even when it's doing nothing or worse um this th that that it, it's just assumed that the un is an objectively good thing and is up to objectively good things. And I think that as the, one of the problems um, that we encountered over and over again was that, that the ability to even meet um, the, the demands of a daily schedule in the United Nations overwhelmed the US mission, which is one of the largest in New York and in Geneva. And so for smaller countries, for countries that don't have our heft, trying to keep up with what's going on in the United Nations is impossible because the agenda, as I mentioned, has grown so unwieldy that the Chinese have a lot of places that they can just work unimpeded because nobody's really even paying attention to what they're doing. Um, and, and so a lot of it is that, that we just don't, we can't cover the, the field the way they do. Um, and, and that they are basically able to put unlimited resources into the things that they care about because they aren't doing things like funding UNICEF at 25% or funding the World Food Program or funding UNHCR. They don't provide, I mean, they provide pennies to those organizations that are doing what most people associate with the work of the United Nations, this humanitarian effort. But they're right incredibly strategic so about how they allocate their resources across the system, whereas we just, oh, we get a, we get a request 
for a humanitarian appeal and we're like, okay, here's 20, our 25% commitment to that. It's, you know, we just, we've got to start to, to look at how we're spending money. It's not that we're not spending enough money at the UN, $18 billion a year is plenty. We should be getting more value just from a pure, and, and I don't think we even like to talk about that. That's something that we don't even really talk about because of this whole global public good mentality that we bring to the UN, which is right. But I think that being a little bit more hard-headed means that we have to question some of the assumptions that we have had going into this system that have allowed China to manipulate it and use it the way that they do. I think that um, that's, that's something that we haven't really done. Um, Ambassador Brumberg is right that the Overton window has shifted in terms of people's concerns about what China is up to, but we're now playing huge amounts of catch up and whack-a-mole, basically. You know, we'll try to solve one problem and then three more will pop up over here because they, you know, we're, we're just behind the eight ball on a lot of these tactics that they've been using and in the way that we approach these institutions. and and whether we are willing to use leverage um, in, in ways that, that make us uncomfortable. And when, when I say that, I mean, for instance, I don't have a problem with the Biden administration coming back in and rejoining these organizations, rejoining the World Health Organization, or rejoining even the Human Rights Council, but doing it without demanding something, without trying to, we know, the Biden administration knows what the problems are with the Human Rights Council. They know what the problems are in the World Health Organization and with Tedros. They know what the, the issues are in, in UNESCO and in some of these other organizations. But instead of coming in and saying, we want to rejoin these organizations, but we'd like to use this leverage of you want us to come back, let's work on what we can do to get some of these problems solved with our allies and partners who want us to rejoin these organizations and with the UN agencies themselves that benefit from our presence. So I think that that's got to be part of the conversation is that we've got to, we can't just give away leverage. We're not in a, not, we don't have the luxury of giving away le leverage right now. And we have to understand that even with all of the, the challenges that my fellow panelists pointed out in terms of how we we are our inconsistency as a democratic country that comes in and out the way we do. When the democratic um, process produces leaders who want to engage more, those leaders need to be a little bit more hard-headed and tougher in terms of using the leverage that their predecessors have, have created for them. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about my own experience engaging at the UN Human Rights Council. When I became a Deputy Assistant Secretary of International Organizations in the early uh, period of the Obama administration, the US had been out of the Human Rights Council and rejoined after a period when the Bush administration had withdrawn. And there was a lot of skepticism about the council at the time. People thought the council was biased, that it was feckless, uh, that we could have no influence, that it was even dangerous. There had been a resolution on Sri Lanka that was an embarrassment that essentially praised the Sri Lankan government for genocidal actions. And it was our job to try to prove that the US's presence could deliver results for American interests. And that required even building up belief in that among the Foreign Service and the, the bureaucracy itself within the State Department. No one believed we could get anything done. And the way we went about it was methodically. We began with a couple of uh, pieces of low, lower hanging fruit. I remember there were early, China was very much opposed to any resolutions on country situations. They believed it was not the role of the UN's human rights mechanism to look at the affairs of individual countries. And they wanted to block that categorically and they had done so successfully. And we began choosing country situations that were somewhat less pro higher profile, Kyrgyzstan and I remember Congo, and getting resolutions passed by uh, going around delegation by delegation in Geneva, in Washington, in capitals where necessary to marshal votes and consensus so that by the time the resolution was tabled, we knew we had the votes. And that kind of ground game really does work. The US at, you know, playing this at its best can, you, uh, Ambassador Curry talked about the apathy. I think US diplomacy is the antidote to that apathy. People have to be educated and engaged about what the stakes are, what can be achieved. You have to raise it at high levels. You have to 
engage the bilateral relationship and the different equities there. And in so doing, over time, we had a whole string of achievements that remain to this day, creation of a special rapporteur to look at uh, Iran, uh, resolutions on and investigative commissions on Syria and Libya, the first ever UN resolution on digital freedom, defeating an effort to gain an international treaty to ban the defamation of religion, a, a crucial free expression issue. So we demonstrated that through this level of intensive diplomacy, and it's, it is resource intensive in the sense that you're right, there's a lot going on and the US has to be ahead of the curve. But compared to dealing with these situations as they worsen, it's a very cost-effective investment in diplomacy, and it really does work. I think the key is that consistency, that you're not playing catch up each time, that relationships are built and credibility is uh, manifested uh, and accrued over time, both with UN officials and with foreign delegations that expect us to be there and that are looking for US leadership. And I am convinced that through consistently pursuing that kind of strategy, the US can successfully push back on Chinese efforts to uh, turn the UN in, 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 its, uh, in the direction of its own interests. Thank you. You know, we're dealing with an issue, and I've already had a hearing on it, I've raised it repeatedly, including with officials at the UNHCR, where China is forcibly repatriating large numbers of, of um, North Korean women, who, uh, separating them in many cases from their families. They've married uh, Chinese men, they're almost all women. Uh, and they're being, uh, I mean, it's the, quintessential example, textbook example of, of reformant. They're going from China, which is not a good place to be, to be in the first place, particularly if you're a dissident, uh, to North Korea, where they are seen as traitors under Pyongyang's barbaric policies. And I have raised it repeatedly with the UNHCR, and we've given them, what, some $2 billion, far in excess of the assessed amount. Matter of fact, if you look at assessments versus voluntary, it's $3 billion total assessments, 15 billion that we give by way of voluntary, and I think that's something that needs a, a tremendous amount of scrutiny, because uh, we've gotten nowhere on that, nowhere. Um, you know, I'm not saying UNHCR can do a magic wand, but they can certainly raise it in a very aggressive way. These women are going to a situation where they'll be going to prison. At least 600 have been forcibly repatriated. Many more are, are in, in harm's way, uh, about to be, uh, uh, involuntarily repatriated and and um, you know let them go to South Korea but but don't or let them stay where they're at don't force them back and uh, I've been deeply disappointed that the UNH and again let's everybody knows it China is a signatory to the refugee convention so there's no doubt that they have a international obligation to protect those individuals uh, and they're not and uh, but I think that's just one example of many uh, you know, at times it does work. I mean, I remember when, uh, during the Reagan-Bush years, uh, I traveled with Amanda Valadares to the Human Rights Commission, as it was called then. The council is a distinction without a difference, really. But it's a new name change. All the reforms we hoped for did not materialize. Rogue nations still sit, uh, uh, you know, in judgment and obviously push back on any serious scrutiny of their own records. But I went with Amanda Valadares for a week uh, in Geneva, he was the head of, our, head of our delegation. He got an excellent UN Human Rights Commission resolution passed to investigate the prisons. There, there was an absolute assurance anybody who comes forward would not be retaliated against. Everybody who came forward was retaliated against by Fidel Castro. Uh, and there was no, the reason for the raising this, there was no follow-up consequence. There was nothing that the UN Human Rights Commission said, whoa, time out, you know, let's, let's bring the, the Cuban delegation in front of us, you know, um, we had an assurance that it was absolutely abrogated uh, by that dictatorship. So, um, so there have been pockets of where we thought we had a lot of hope, things were happening, and then uh, I do wish, and I, with deep respect to my colleagues, uh, you know, UNESCO was brought up in terms of our rearage there. Uh, I think it's, 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 it was an important during the Obama years. I remember Ambassador there, who I knew very well. Uh, you know, he was, was very sickened by the, by the UNESCO's um, uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, so, you know, what, you know, there needs to be a look at when we 
decide, even with an assessment, we're not going to go forward with uh, providing that money uh, on a very principled, for a principled reason, uh, that that doesn't become, and I remember with Unperfor, because uh, I led an effort on that, uh, you know, here we were, and I actually wrote op-eds and did floor speeches about how uh, when you factored in everything else, all the airlift alone that we provided to the Balkans and everything else, the number, amount of money so far exceeded what we were alleged to have to provide to UMPRA for, uh, and, you know, which was the arrearage uh, issue of the day. And uh, it's like, oh, but now with what we're doing voluntarily, that, we can't make that case. Uh, I think we should, but we don't do it well enough. But so that's, you know, if you may, may want to comment on that. And also, if, Ambassador Bremberg, especially, um, WHO Director Tedros. I remember that so well when he got the job. Obviously, he was health minister for, for Ethiopia. Uh, uh, the Mellis regime that he was a part of uh, committed great numbers of human rights abuses. Uh, he was credibly, uh, 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 it was alleged that he covered up cholera up outbreaks. This is Tedros now, which could have been a, could have been, a, a forerunner of what's he going to do when he's pressured. You know, as director general, he should have spoken. He should, should have been outspoken. And I think, as you said, the right questions were asked, we believe. But, you know, for the sake of all the people in my state who died, and I know many people who died from COVID-19 and families um, and everywhere else in the world, um, you know, how could he have covered that up, especially during those critical, uh, uh, you know, um, weeks and months in the early going with, with COVID. So um, uh, maybe you, well, I want to speak to how they got that. You know, there was a UK reformer I know that was running. I'm not sure he was the best uh, uh, candidate ever, but, but he was talking about real reform at WHO, as were some others. Uh, and Tedros got it, and then he gets a, a re-election. Uh, and we have not gotten to the bottom of that whole thing. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I went to Geneva after he was already elected, so I had not worked on his initial election in 2017. But um, as I mentioned in my remarks, and I'm happy to expand upon, um, it was extremely disappointing to see how he took his role as director general um, and led the WHO at this time. Let me be very clear. This is true of the WHO. This is also a point I'd make as it relates to um, um, H U UNHCR, uh, other UN bodies. They are not responsible for China's actions. China is responsible for China's actions. No one believes that any of these UN bodies as a body or any of the individuals that are leaders can somehow force China to change its behavior. I want to just make that clear from my perspective. I doubt anyone actually believes this, but I feel that like this goes unsaid. What these institutions and individuals are responsible for and have total control over is their behavior. It was China's fault that they hid information. It is the WHO's fault that they lied about China hiding information. They knew that China was not being transparent and then would choose to publicly praise China for setting a new standard in public health transparency. I, I had, I remember in very early on, it was either January or February of 2020, I met with, when I'm in many, many meetings with Tedros, where knowing that the US had a particularly strong history between the US CDC and China CDC, he asked me, have you all been getting more detailed epidemiologic data out of China because we haven't been? And I kind of jokingly said to him, well, I'm glad you asked that question. I was going to ask you the same thing because I've just heard from our CDC that we're not getting this information. And I was going to ask you, are you? Because we find this troubling. Moments later, he publicly announced that China had set the standard in public health transparency when knowing they weren't. That is the moral failing of the WHO leadership at the time. And unfortunately, in many cases, the leadership of many of these UN bodies when addressing the issues of China. They are intimidated, they feel um, afraid, and I feel, and then I'm not trying to uh, psychoanalyze them much, I feel they sometimes think, because they're um, important political figures, that if they let on that they're not powerful or responsible, that somehow diminishes their role. When in fact, the value of their role is the power of speech. 
No UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has the ability to stop human rights violations. We all know that. The, the United States and other member states, when we created the Office of the High Commissioner, knew that across the UN system, we know that we as you know, member states are gonna have security challenges, economic challenges, different political issues that will come up across member states. And even though we believe deeply in human rights, maybe we won't always put them forward. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna create this special office that has no interests in security or economic issues or political issues, that has one mandate and one job, to speak the truth about human rights violations. And when you have a leader like the former High Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, who is unconscionably cold and blinded, I, I correct myself, not blinded, aware, but unconscionably, um, I would go so far as to say complicit in cover up of China's human rights abuses, that is damning to the entire UN system, particularly those offices and the efforts of multi-member state organizations, individual member states trying to take steps. I, I, I've gone on too long. I demarched Michelle Bachelet on multiple uh, occasions about the delayed release of their report on the human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. And of course, as noted, she released that report, I believe it's eight minutes left in her tenure, maybe 13 minutes. Um, uh, there was a damning report. But I want to step back and say, she's gone, that's great. We have a new high commissioner. And I have hope that he you know, will do better than the last one. But what steps has the United States government taken to make sure that happens? Lots of questions get asked about funding. I, I understand some of the issues as it relates to arrears, but I think we have recent history that shows tighter controls of US funding for UN organizations can actually reach um, positive outcomes and success. Uh, in, the, in years past, there were issues around whistleblower protections and that we had instances of UN bodies where they um, abused whistleblowers. Congress put in place funding restrictions that prohibited US taxpayer dollars to go to certain UN bodies um, that have whistleblower, um, act, had um, credible allegations of, of violating whistleblower protections. That was an important thing and that actually helped. I think both the executive branch and the, and the legislature can work together to develop new mechanisms for how you can give policy flexibility to you know, ambassadors that are at their post to the Secretary of State around um, actually using the power of the purse that Congress has through our foreign policy executed by the executive branch um, to ensure that US interests are being put forward at these UN bodies, or at the very least, I and mean, then obviously this is a clear bipartisan area of support, that actions are being taken to counter China's influence in these organizations. Uh, would you want to comment on Emma Riley? Because I thought that was a notorious case of whistleblowers. And you know, I remember when Dick Thornburg sat right there and called for serious reform at the UN with IGs and whistleblower protections and the like. And all of us on both sides of the aisle said, absolutely. You know, it works here, not perfectly, but it does work here. And um, unfortunately, that has been a disappointment in the extreme. Um, we, we've seen it over and over again, and then with whistle, whistleblowers especially. But Emma Riley, it, would anyone want to comment on her or, or not? Or for the record, you I, can do it. I can, look, I, I think that the, the Emma Riley case illustrates the structural nature of the problem, that it's, <clears throat> it goes beyond these individual leaders to the entire structural problem that the UN in, a, in the way, and especially the way that a lot of these agencies function and, and the incentive structure for their leaders is such that they say nice things about the worst people in public and say mean things about democratically elected leaders in public because they believe that using public pressure works on democratically elected leaders, but they've come to believe that, it, that public pressure doesn't That's work on authoritarian leaders. I think that this is wrong. I think that this, and, and it leads to, it's, it's a per, there's a pervasive, what I call a pervasive pro-authoritarian bias in the way that the UN operates as a result of absorbing this idea that if you are publicly speaking out against 
these authoritarian and, and dictatorial leaders that don't care about their own people, then you're somehow, you're going to lose access and you're not going to be able to help the people in that country um, with whatever your mission is as a UN agency head. Um, and, and instead, you save your worst criticisms in public for democracies, and whether it's the United States or Israel or other democratic countries that are that are trying to to deal with their own security, economic, political issues, whatever. Um, and so I think that understanding that there is this this problematic asymmetry in the way that the entire system works, and understanding how that benefits. China and the CCP in terms of how they, and that they know this, they get this and they use this. They use their ability to turn off access and the fact that there's no consequence for them denying access um, for human, for special rapporteurs. I mean, we have a policy of the United States that any special rapporteur or special procedure that requests a visit to the United States, we will allow them to come. We have a policy of open access. It is our stated policy. China doesn't have anything like that. They, they would never uh, uh, even come close to that, but they are still just as eligible, eligible to be in the Human Rights Council as the United States is. That should be a prerequisite for being a Human Rights Council member. That was one of the things that we put forward as a, as a reform, that there should be some qualifications here. And it's not, you know, bad country can't. It's do you allow human rights special rapporteurs and special procedures to come into your country freely? Do you have an open invitation to them? That's an indicator of whether you are actually really engaging this system in a genuine way or whether you're just using it as a shield to defend your own behavior um, and, and your abuse of your own people. So I think that there are things that we can do that will have bipartisan support, like you mentioned, with whether it's increasing IGs, increasing accountability and transparency across the system. Everybody who represents US taxpayers should care about what our money is being spent on at the United Nations. We shouldn't just be giving them a blank check. There, that should never happen. And we should be holding all of these agencies, funds, and programs accountable, whether it's on whistleblower protection or on how their leaders handle it when a major country that purports to be a pillar of the international community completely disregards UNHCR's, you know, the foundational principle of non refoulement or disregards the international health regulations in a way that endangers the entire planet. Like, there is zero accountability right now for China or other countries when they violate these basic norms of conduct in the international community. And, you know, but, and that's got to change. If we, if we want different results, we've got to do something different. If we keep doing the same thing, we'll keep getting the same result. So I think that that's really, understanding this asymmetry though, that operates within, it's, it's just part of the wiring at the UN right now and the way that the UN works. And I, I would love to say that getting more Americans and more of our allies personnel into that system would be helpful, but I'm not sure that if they're, it's, it, you know, isolated, we, we, it would have to be in a mass way because the structure and culture of the system is such that I, I don't, having just, you know, two or three people here or there is not going to make enough difference. We've got to actually get to our proportional weight in the system in terms of staffing um, and, and, and really work on changing the culture inside the UN so that they no longer defer to authoritarian states and save their, their heavy weapons for, for democracies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just a few comments. The US has always chafed at the rules at the UN and for good reason. There are many frustrating aspects of the way that that body operates. Uh, there are norms and requirements that should be in place. Uh, having countries that are notorious abusers of human rights on oversight bodies always provokes outrage. And so I understand that, but I've also learned through experience that it is very difficult to change those rules 
And to go in, I remember when we were first trying to renegotiate US uh, contributions to the UN and get an, a new system and formula in place, people said, well, just, you know, the Chinese at the time were paying about 1% of the regular budget. People said, just create a floor at 3%. It's like, uh, you know, and at first I said, oh, that makes sense. But it was not something you could negotiate through. We needed to get an agreement that at the time 185 member states were going to sign up to, and we needed to come up with a principled rationale for that. We needed to understand where every country wanted to come out, to engage with them, to explain it. And when we did that, we came up with a result that the US honestly celebrated as uh, very much in line with our interests. So in my experience, the, the better path to the defense of US interests is trying to work the system through those rules most of the time. From time to time, there are opportunities to change those rules. There are moments of inflection and reform, and that we should absolutely engage forcefully in those. But I think we spend, we waste time sort of chafing and ruing at what we don't like about the system, and those are energies that we could spend in defending and asserting our interests within that system. You know, I think the same is true when it comes to withholding. There may be uh, examples of occasions where we've successfully exercised leverage, but I, by and large, I think we have diminished our leverage because we've given our adversaries a persistent talking point about how we're not reliable, we don't pay on time in full, uh, we condition our support, and I think they have been able to make uh, greater use uh, and gain greater leverage from that than we have. Uh, you know, and when we withdraw, for example, from UNESCO because we are concerned about anti-Semitism, that seeds the ground to those that have very different perspective on that issue. And you know, now that we're back in UNESCO, Holocaust education has been restored, uh, and we can play a role in, in shaping the organization's priorities. So I worry about that idea that by absenting yourself you're, uh, you know, suddenly people are going to come around and start, uh, you know, get behind the issues you care about. I don't think we really see that happening. You know, when it comes to what Ambassador Curry is talking about as far as, you know, how we reshape the debate on these issues, I think it requires a sophisticated approach that involves press and media, the engagement of civil society, calling out issues like the one that you raised in terms of North Korean women being improperly repatriated. And it's an inside and an outside uh, kind of advocacy effort that I think at its best the U.S. can do very well on. I think we need to assert a norm that U.N. officials cannot be accessories to authoritarianism, that that needs to be a precept, and we need to call that out. We need to document that. We need people who are reporting on instances in which uh, U.N. staff fall into those patterns, uh, and that you know is something that through deep engagement I think the U.S. can achieve. And just a final note, I remember those days uh, of Dick Thornburg and then it was Joe Connor uh, who were doing, had that position within the UN on management reform. And there was a lot of pro progress made during that period of the creation of the of OIOS, the investigative office at the UN. And that has been an important step forward. So it's worth acknowledging that when we have engaged deeply and uh, had concrete actionable proposals for reform, we can make lasting change because we're now decades later. Okay, thank you very much. You know, I do hope, maybe you'd want to comment on this and then I'll yield to Ms. Manning. <clears throat> but like with UNESCO, I remember Robert Killian who used to serve on this committee and he was um, chief of staff for the Helsinki Commission, which I chaired um, for a number of years. Uh, he was our ambassador to UNESCO and, and he was appalled uh, with the textbooks and the, and the, and the very serious anti-Semitism. So while we may be subjected to criticism by the Chinese or someone uh, for not, you know, for withdrawing our funding, we don't want to enable it. When you provide those those very serious numbers of dollars, uh, you advance it, you make it worse. Um, you know, we're having a big issue, we're all having a big issue uh, with um, um, uh, the problem of how do you help the people in Gaza who have genuine humanitarian uh, needs while not giving the money to uh, an organization that has shown itself repeatedly to be not only anti-Semitic, but it has been uh, the incubator of child soldiers. You know, you teach a kid who's four years old uh, in an UNRWA uh, school uh, to hate Jews, by the time he's eight or nine, he's 
while on his way to carrying a rifle or throwing a grenade or doing something, and that's what has happened. And I pointed out during our debate the other day in this committee, when I had a, a bill that passed the committee, uh, that, that, you know, we'll provide humanitarian aid, but who we provide it through, who, the vehicle, is all important. And, um, you know, in 2003, I offered an amendment to say, move the money away from UNRWA to vetted NGOs and the like, even UN agencies that are not continuing this cycle of hatred towards Jewish people. Passed the House, never got through the Senate. Uh, again, you know, Senate kills a lot of good bills, but that one was one of them. So, you know, we could have really made a difference then. You would have, might have had fewer kids who are just chomping at the bit to kill a Jewish person, a man or a woman or a child. And um, so, you know, we'll get criticized again, I'm sure, for not providing money to uh, um, UNES to um, to uh, uh, UNRWA, but boy, it, it, it's rife with hatred. I've I've had hearings where we went through the textbooks. They hate Americans, they being the teachers, and they hate. You can't say every one of them, but I don't know any that don't. You know, in terms of their teaching curricula, uh, and they absolutely hate Israelis and Jewish people. Ms. Manning. Thank you so much. Uh, to my good friend Chairman Smith for holding this hearing, uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Ambassador Bremberg, let me start with you. I'm very concerned about our adversaries, Russia and China's attempts to dominate the next generation of critical technology through the ITU, the IEC, the ISO, and the IETF, and that's why I introduced the bipartisan Securing Global Technical Securing Global Telecommunications Act with my good friend, Representative Young Kim, which would require the State Department to report to Congress on these efforts. So how concerned should we be about China's attempts to leverage their private sector to advance their national interests through the ITU? And do you feel that the State Department is doing enough with our own American businesses to help counter their influence? Thank you, that's a very important question. Um, no, I don't believe the department is doing enough. Um, I think, I, I, I worry there's a little bit of a sigh of relief that in the post-2022 uh, SG election that you know the, the, the previous SG is gone. We now have an American head of the ITU. This is to be applauded, this is a good thing. Um, but incredible work has been done over the last decade to entrench um, this kind of ideological approach inside the ITU, and I think that's really important. You specifically mentioned the private sector. This has been a huge um, problem. Um, I, I addressed this when I was uh, at a post there, trying to get U.S. private sector to engage in the ITU. I think that's something the State Department can do a much better job of, um, because as we know, China doesn't have a real private sector. But what they do is they pretend they do, and they have it come to the table, and at all these uh, standard bodies, standard making bodies and meetings, have them speak about these issues. And unfortunately, sometimes the United States private sector is literally not there. When we and are in fact meeting- And why are they not there? So I, I, I asked them that question. Uh, I would encourage you to ask the State Department and ask these companies the, the same question. My uh, response that I received, I would summarize as they don't see the value. Um, they're, they're important for-profit organizations. They want to make sure that they're producing top-level technology, and they were less concerned and didn't see the value in taking time out of their weeks to travel to some ITU conference where they're going to work on some sort of standard-setting body where I think in, in their minds they think, we're not going to be bound by that. We're, we're going to innovate beyond that anyway, so what's potentially the value? I think that's incumbent on the U.S. government to explain to them why it's in their interest um, because it's very possible that in their limited economic interest, it may not be in their, in their interest, but it is absolutely in the United States' interest to ensure that these standards do not get created with the CCP's imprimatur on top of them, because that will then impact um, their eventual business interest in other countries as well. So um, that's the biggest source of concern, is it's not that it will ne negatively impact security in the United States. We have very good policies and security here, but this will be a tool to spread this authoritarian model around the world in other countries. All right, so one takeaway is that our, our government, and I assume it's State Department, but it also may be the Commerce Department, needs to engage with the private sector to help them understand that this is in their long-term interest to participate in these standard-setting bodies. Thank you for that. Um, 
Um, Ms. Nossel, in your testimony, you described China's role among a newfound axis of disruptors on the world stage, along with Russia, North Korea, and Iran. How can increased engagement at the UN, particularly on the human rights side, prevent these countries' attempts to undermine universal values and help hold them accountable for their abuses? Sure, thank you so much for the question, uh, Representative Manning. Uh, by engaging intensively at the UN and in the Human Rights Council specifically, the United States can fortify its alliances, it can build coalitions, it can get ahead of resolutions and actions that are gonna be protective of these countries. For example, China, when it underwent the Universal Periodic Review, things like ensuring that civil society organizations that are going to be hard hitting and forthright in their criticisms are on the list and can make their statements, working with other countries to develop like statements of the like-minded so that there, it's not just the US asserting itself, uh, but a broad coalition, including countries from the global south, there is a playbook for achieving U.S. interests and calling out the most egregious human rights violators, but it requires intensive relationship building, collaboration between the delegation in Geneva, the regional bureaus at the State Department, the diplomatic posts that we have around the world who can help us marshal and whip votes so that we have the support to defeat uh, that which we are against and we can advance important resolutions that hold countries accountable. Why are we not doing that now? I think we do, but it, one point I have stressed is that it needs to be consistent. It's really difficult when you have these cycles of engagement and withdrawal and the U.S. is sort of finding itself uh, in a position of rupture and repair and it's kind of coming back to the table after a period of absentia Consistent, steady engagement is what the Chinese are doing. They're just on a trajectory to build their influence uh, further and further. And we go through these cycles uh, of feast or famine. And I think with a more consistent bipartisan approach, we could uh, be far more effective. Okay, your colleagues are about to jump out of their chairs. Uh, Ambassador <laughs> Bremberg, you clearly think we don't do it appropriately. And, and can you address the, the idea that we do it in cycles? Yes. And why is that? Uh, much has been said about this kind of cycles aspect of kind of engagement versus retreat, and I want to address that because I think that's part of this issue. Um, and, I, and I mean this quite respectfully. Some of the examples that were just mentioned of, you know, we were ensuring that civil organizations would have access to the HRC in order to del deliver statements. That should be beneath our concern. We, sh we should have a much higher standard when it comes to human rights. That the idea that we're worried about whether our civil rights organizations have access, that should be a given, okay? When the United States leads, other countries follow. So what I would say is this back and forth retreat engagement aspect, I think not enough has been focused on that when the United States has disengaged from these organizations, people start to think about the consequences of that. When we left the Human Rights Council in 2018, Ambassador Curry can talk more about this, a lot of that had to do with Europe was blind to the human rights threat posed by China at the time. And maybe you want to reiterate some of the aspect. Two years later, after we had left, China brought their same resolution back before the HRC. And guess what? Europe called the vote, which we know is a kind of aggressive UN action, and voted against it. They would not have done that had we not shown the spine. A couple brief examples. You know, we, we left the HRC. I knew with certain that the incoming administration would rejoin the HRC. We had announced our intention to leave the WHO, and I knew the new administration would rejoin these organizations. I understood that. They missed the opportunity of massive leverage to insist on some structural reforms that, as, 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 as Suzanne has mentioned, you have to work within those structural reforms, the, the, the rules that take place, but we lose half the battle when we don't realize we have the moral leadership and political ability to change the rules, to strengthen the rules, to actually strengthen the UN. So I think that's one of the big problems that gets missed is that when we are pulling back and saying, you know what, you know, this is a problem, this is enough, we're gonna pull back on that, we don't insist on reforms before coming back in. 
Thank you. And I want to get back to changing the rules, but Ambassador Curry, I want to ask you a slightly different question. Uh, China's sphere of influence is growing most rapidly in technology and cyberspace. And in your statement, you described how China is the lone funder for the UN Global Geospatial Knowledge and Innovation Center, which maps human behavior, infrastructure, and topographic topography worldwide. So how should the United States and our partners ensure that this information stays within program restraints and that the data is not stolen and abused by China? So thank you for bringing up the Global Geospatial Knowledge and Innovation Center, which was something that the Chinese government created. This is a good example, again, of them using their targeted um, voluntary contributions to advance their own agenda and, and in ways that look like they're trying to help others, but really are just for their own benefit. Um, this was a project that they set up in the UN Statistical Agency, which is, again, one of these backwaters that nobody pays any attention to most of the time, but actually does a lot of work for the United Nations in terms of, again, when UNDP or any or WHO or any of the other agencies needs data on the health outcomes or the educational attainment or whatever in a country, it's, a lot of this is coming through this, this specialized statistical agency. And in the member state body that oversees this, China put forward this, this plan for this center, this special center that they would host in a, in a location that is co-located right next to an industrial park that is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. And so it is all in, and it's right next to the Chinese statistical agency that does their own data analytics and is working on big data, big data models, including AI, um, large language models, things like that, that are very important, and that Xi Jinping has indicated is one of the top priorities for technology for the CCP. So this was something, it just, it's one of these things that because we weren't paying attention and some, they, they've, again, how the UN ends up funding something like this in the first place is, is, is something we need to understand better. <clears throat> we need to do a better job of kind of parsing where the opportunities are for mischief, either shutting them down or making sure that we've got officers on top of these things and paying attention, um, that we are not just, you know, th that we don't, a lot of times I felt like at, at the US mission to the United Nations, the Security Council is the big sexy ticket and everybody's looking at what the Security Council is doing, but all the nonsense was going on in these little nooks and crannies that nobody cared about and I could not get you know, resources to. So it was a, you know, part of it is understanding how China attacks this system and being ready to respond to it, not just assuming that they are doing things in the daylight. <clears throat> and that's, that's a big part of it for us to reorient our thinking about how they are attacking these little nooks and crannies and, and trying to drain this, these, these areas of their ability to cause harm. Um, but I think that one of the things that we then have also done is worked with countries that were targeted by this as Beijing basically went around and said, bring us your data and we'll help you learn how to use it more effectively. And we're like, yeah, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. Um, and so we've done, we did a lot of going around and working with countries and saying, we will help you. We will provide you with you know, secure facilities and we came up with an alternative working through the national laboratories and the Department of Energy that provided another opportunity for countries that really wanted data analytics and would know that their data was, be was secure and not being shipped over to the Chinese AI you know, machine next door. So it, it really was, um, that, that was something where we had to get creative and come up with a multi-agency solution and, and do some backdoor diplomacy around it. Um, I, I think that it is important though, and I, I wanna go back to something that Andrew mentioned because when we were talking about the Human Rights Council and, and the fact that when we left, the Europeans stopped hiding. They had, they, they liked, countries don't wanna have to be the bad guy. And so we often, but we will be the bad guy. We will, one of the reasons that we, you know, people don't always love us at the United Nations is because we will be the bad guy. We will do the tough things. We will take a principled stand, even when it's kind of not in our interest. Um, and the Europeans love to hide behind us. 
when we're doing and and not have to do it. And so when we're not there on the Human Rights Council, they have to call these votes or the vote goes ahead. Otherwise, they can hide behind us and not have to ever take a stand. It's the same on Israel. It's the same on China. It's the same on a lot of these issues where they will they they fear getting punished by the global global south or the G77 if they take a tough stand that upsets those countries or is contrary to their interests we will do that and you know we're not we're not afraid to do it most of the time and so they, they are it's very convenient for a lot of countries i think that it is important from time to time for us to step back and let and force some of these other countries to to have to do the hard things and get used to being uncomfortable in those roles i think it's really really important okay. for us. Okay, so this do. time it's your colleague to the left, and I don't want to mispronounce your name. Nozzle, or? Yes. You've got it right. A nozzle, okay. This time you look like you're jumping out of your seat to respond, so if you would, and then I have one final question with your indulgence. Yeah, sure, look, uh, you know, I worked on what I think it was one of the most significant examples of the U.S. using its leverage to extract reforms at the UN when we repaid our arrears back during the Clinton administration and got a reduction in the US's regular budget uh, assessment rate and our peacekeeping rate and a series of other reforms. So I do understand that method, but it takes time to build diplomatic connections and capital. And you know what we've seen is time and again, we're going back to the starting line and having to begin all over. It takes years to accrete to a point where you can get a major contested resolution passed. We can exercise leverage, but the instrument, the way we use it, is very blunt. We know what our frustrations are, but we've rarely thought through what exact reforms would address them, never mind whether those reforms are achievable or how they could conceivably be achieved. Is it something that the Secretariat would have to do? Is it something that can only be addressed through actions of the member state. And so there's a disconnect between this idea that we want to wield the stick and the notion that we're actually achieving concrete results. At the UN Human Rights Council, there is a provision whereby countries have to step off uh, uh, periodically. And so that imperative for others to come forward and assert leadership is sort of built into the system. And what we found was for the United States, rarely were we at the forefront publicly of these resolutions. We did a lot of the diplomatic groundwork. Oftentimes it was our idea, but we worked with partners so that it was presented always as a cross-regional group. It wasn't just the Western countries behind an initiative. We recruited allies from the rest of the world, and that made those resolutions far more credible and palatable. It made it easier to gain allies to attract votes. And so those methods of collaboration consistently over time, I think in the long run are what is going to pay off for the United States far more in this moment where we really confront serious contestation at the United Nations because of China in a way that we never have before. So let me end by asking a question that I think goes to the issue you've all talked about, building longer term relationships, building uh, coalitions with our allies, and then using our leverage. One area where um, I don't think we've been able to use leverage to achieve the result we've been looking for for many years is with UNRWA. And for many years, we have been uh, talking about and trying to stop the virulent anti-Semitism that is embedded in the UNRWA textbooks and taught at UNRWA schools. And we get lip service to the fact that teachers are told, well, just don't teach those sections of the textbook. But what we've seen um, what is that it has not been successful. I have gone to schools and talked to uh, UNRWA students myself and, and learned that uh, we are not being successful in stopping anti-Semitism from being taught and anti-Israel uh, lessons being taught in the UNRWA schools. And in fact, on October 7th, we saw that um, at least 12 UNRWA workers literally took part in the invasion of Israel and assisted with not just taking hostages, but keeping hostages. So I had an opportunity to ask questions of one of the UNRWA officials and ask whether they vet their 13,000 plus employees 
in Gaza to see if they are connected with Hamas or part of Hamas. And I was told, well, we, we vet them on 7 million data points, but we do not vet them on whether they are members of Hamas or connected with Hamas because we only use the UN data points. And since the UN does not consider Hamas to be a terrorist group, they are not vetted to determine whether they whether those 13,000 employees are members of Hamas or Hamas sympathizers or, or assist with Hamas. How do you respond to that? Because that's clearly a failure to use our leverage effectively. I think we're at an inflection point on that issue now. And you know those concerns and the concerns about what happened uh, and the role of certain uh, UNRWA employees on October the 7th are at the forefront. And I think it's a moment where there has to be a reevaluation and a reinvention. The UN has many arms that provide humanitarian and refugee assistance that are considered credible, that the United States has worked with closely, uh, the World Food Program, which we lead. And so what is the, an approach that would engage the totality of the United Nations to provide for those essential pressing humanitarian needs in Gaza, which I think we all acknowledge are very real and desperate and cannot be put aside. We're not gonna be able to solve this overnight, but I think there is a moment where now the issues that you're raising can be looked at, uh, can finally be a, a subject of some real transformation in how, how the UN system goes about this. And I, I think the other UN agencies need to play a crucial role in that. Ambassador Brumberg, you're, you look like you've got something to say. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree, um, but, but really the time of that was years ago. I mean, as, as Chairman Smith said, the House passed the bill and the Senate never passed it. This problem would have been prevented had we addressed the issue kind of when it, when it came to our attention and, and dealt with. Um, and we face this across other UN organizations today. And that's exactly the framework that I think I was advocating for, that we should take a tougher, reform-minded stand, draw where appropriate, draw lines in the sand, work with partners and allies, and insist that structural reforms be made in every individual organization. And those are gonna be different. I mean, we're talking about the UNRWA case. That is not China's malign influence. That's a different problem. But the US approach should take, as we engage in every UN body, we identify what is it are our strategic priorities, what, how do our values come out through this organization, and then look at how is it actually operating, and then take an approach to say, what reforms do we think are necessary and should be done? And in some cases, not, not all, we should draw hard lines that say, you know, these reforms, may, maybe we can achieve through just a negotiation of the, inter, of the current rules. But in other cases, we know they can't. So we're gonna draw a hard line and say, our participation is now conditioned, or future going. I mean, the, the, the question was raised earlier about that somehow some, we don't actually specify what reforms we want. I mean, in 2018, we submitted uh, detailed reforms to the, uni to the Universal Postal Union, uh, important UN body that deals with postal dues. They were ignored. So the United States issued our intent to withdraw from the Universal Postal Union one year later. And 11 months later, there is a special extraordinary session of the UPU that addressed our concerns and the problem was fixed. So I think there's lots of other examples we can point to where taking a principled um, leadership role, explaining what reforms need to take place in order for this organization to merit US support and participation can be done. And as long as we do that, I think we're best off when we do that in a strong bipartisan way with our partners and allies around the world. We absolutely can strengthen these organizations, one, to address things like UNRWA, but also critically to address the aggressive approach taken by the CCP and the UN today. Is there an underlying problem with UNRWA's fundamental mandate, which is not to resettle the refugees, but just to protect them? Yes, that, that, that's a separate issue, but yes, I agree. Thank you. Are you okay if we have one more? Um, Ambassador Curry. I, I would echo what Ambassador Brumberg said. When we started going around and went, I remember the first time that we told a country that we were going to call a vote on a resolution in the General Assembly because it had Xi Jinping thought language in it. And everybody kind of freaked out. They're like, but this is agreed language. It was in these three other resolutions. And I'm like, I don't care. From now on, 
none of this is happening anymore. And they're like, why are you doing this? And I explained it to them very clearly. I sat, I did, I had so many meetings with so many um, delegations, just and my team, and we were out every single day from morning to night explaining why we were going from this point forward to be blocking Xi Jinping thought language in all UN resolutions. And I was very patient about it, I was, which I am not a naturally patient person, in case you can't tell. Um, it, I was very, I provided them with lots of information, with Chinese documents, with all of the explanation of why we were doing it and how damaging it was, not to us. I, I would say things like, look, if the UN disappeared from the face of the earth tomorrow, this would have zero effect on the prosperity, security, and internal dignity of average Americans. It would have no effect on us. But your country, you actually need the UN for this, 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 and this thing. They provide you actual functioning services. The more this kind of stuff happens, the less the UN becomes able to do this. So it is in your interest to make this place function better and not have Xi Jinping thought be the operating system of the United Nations. And they were like, oh, okay, all right, well, we're gonna abstain then. I'm like, great, just abstain. I'm not even gonna ask you to like, or, or we'll take it out. We'll help you get this out. I'm like, thank you. And then the next time when they were the facilitator of a resolution and the Chinese came in and said, we want you to put this language in, they're like, oh yeah, no, no, no. We're not doing that. The United States is gonna call a vote on it and we want this to go forward by consensus. And, they're, and the Chinese were like, what now? And so it became a thing. And all the countries that were facilitating resolutions in the G77 where the Chinese would come in and try to sneak in their language became aware that it was going to be a problem. And so they stopped taking it. And China eventually stopped trying because we shut it down. We, if we are clear and we explain ourselves a lot of good things can happen, but a lot of times I think that we go in and we just assume that everybody knows why we're doing stuff, which they don't, that, that's fair. And, and so I think that that's a big part of it. I agree with Suzanne in a way that we do need to actually take the time to go out there, do the work, and explain stuff. And, and when that doesn't work though, we do have to be prepared to walk away. We had more than 100 meetings with you on Human Rights Council reform with countries. And we laid out, we worked with them to come up with what it would take to keep us on the council. And it was a pretty low bar, I can tell you. We weren't asking them to fix all the problems, just to show that they were willing to actually address some of the small ones. And we couldn't even get that, so we had to, we're like, look, we can't in good conscience continue to perpetuate this. So I think we've got to be able to use the carrot and the stick. It's not both, it's not just one or the other. Okay, so with the admonition that we should all do our work, I think I will end my questions. Thank you to our chairman. Time apparently is suspended in this hearing and I really appreciate that, but thank you all to our witnesses. And thank I you very back. much, Ms. Penn. <clears throat> just a couple of short questions and then ask you if you'd like to make any closing comments. Uh, and I thank you so much for your providing the subcommittee with the benefit of your wisdom and, and your experience. Uh, with regards to Tibet, um, the Chinese delegation at the UN has been extraordinarily dishonest about the situation in Tibet, parroting disinformation that Beijing pushes globally. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And of course, the ongoing uh, uh, disenfranchisement of Taiwan, which is absurd, uh, and yet they get away with it. And um, you might want to speak to that if you don't mind. And you know, Ambassador Curry, you mentioned about you know not even allowing delegations into China uh, is to do investigations. I'll never forget. You know, I've had probably I've had 101 hearings that I've chaired on human rights abuses in China over these last several years. Many of them focused on torture. And Manfred Nowak did a an amazing report, as have others, um, special rapporteur for torture. But he was even, wasn't even allowed to come in. <laughs> access to China. He had to do it you know, with diaspora and refugees and, and other ways, human rights groups, uh, which is absurd. And then they sit there while they're committing genocide right now as we meet against the Uyghurs, uh, as they use, I've never seen such an, an attempt, except for Mao Zedong, to crush religion and sinitization, you know, to make everything comport to uh, Xi Jinping's principles on religion, and that's all religions. Uh, whether they be Christian, Tibetan, Buddhist, or, or uh, uh, Muslim Uyghurs, or Falun Gong, everyone's got to comport to him, uh, which is absurd. And yet they sit in good standing on the Human Rights Council 
And again, the UPR that just happened, and I did a whole hearing on it just a few weeks ago, uh, was an abomination. Uh, yes, we tried and others tried valiantly, to, to, but they just so gamed the system and ate, ate up the time uh, with, with their um, cow towers who are in the, in the room. So, it's a, so if you might want to speak to that as well, because um, you know, if the Universal Periodic Review uh, isn't aggressive and thorough, uh, and we get an outcome like we had here, where there's all kinds of chaos. Uh, what good was it? You know, it had some good. You know, there's no doubt. And I think we raised some very good questions as a delegation, U.S. But um, if you won't even allow Manfred Nowak or his successors and others access to China, how could you sit on a human rights council? I yield. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman Smith. Um, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment about the problems with the Human Rights Council. I think that's been echoed already. Um, specifically about the UPR, um, I think this is something that, again, I think we kind of believe, but oh, we've put in place this structure for the UPR and that somehow is gonna lead to good outcomes. I think, frankly, at this point, it leads to maybe even worse PR kind of outcomes in the, the sense that you know, China uses the propaganda of these UPRs to go out and say, Look how praised, look, look, how, look how much China was praised in front of the UN on our human rights record. You know, they've, as you know, Ambassador Curry mentioned, they've tried to reshape the notion that human rights is focused through the lens of the right to development and prioritizing rights to um, social and economic rights over civil and political rights. And we know that that is a huge structural problem and that's the, that's the philosophical framework that can lead you to justify things like the genocide in Xinjiang or the treatment in Tibet. I mean, that, that, that's important from a mental from a policy framing perspective. But um, just two specific points, on, one on the UPR. Um, and again, I'm speaking on my personal capacity here. I think the U country, other countries' uh, submissions in the UPR should be taken into account in how the State Department um, assesses that country's human rights record. As we um, compile human rights um, re reports on countries, we should look at what submissions they have made through the UPR and hold them accountable for that. So I think that that's a small, technical thing. I'm, I'm not aware that that's ever been done, but I think that's a way to at least start um, saying to these other countries, you're not going to get a free pass here. You can't just kind of show up, lie in favor of the CCP, and there be no consequences. Because the lesson we have to learn from all of this is that there have to be consequences for bad actions, whether that, that's China's bad actions, whether that's bad actions by you know, senior UN officials or by other countries where we're acting in member state bodies where you know, there, there is no person that's in charge of the Human Rights Council. It's all the countries working together. So there have to be consequences for the countries that choose to act in a certain way. And you importantly mentioned um, Taiwan, and I know we were holding this on the 45th anniversary of the TRA. Um, one point I wanna make on Taiwan and Taiwan participation um, in the UN it has gotten a fair amount of attention, and when I was in Geneva, you know, the U.S. mission did a lot to promote active participation of Taiwan. One thing that I think we haven't done enough of is not just keep fighting for increased participation, but push the U.N. bodies to affirmatively include Taiwan, even in places where um, they, they already have, they're not excluded. We, we should keep fighting those fights around exclusion, but in specific cases where even the PRC has nominally agreed to allow certain things, um, but they are somehow not included. I'll just give one brief example. Um, in my many conversations with Tedros at the WHO, um, the issue around you know, Chinese influence within his directorate and the, the issues of Taiwan information blocking came up quite uh, vividly. Um, there is a kind of secret agreement that goes back decades between the WHO and the PRC around how they're kind of, they interpret the one China policy and how they um, you know, will treat Taiwan. Uh, the US does not you know, support this or believe this is appropriate. Let me state that emphatically. However, within that agreement, WHO maintained the unilateral ability, so not at the approval of the PRC, to send their own experts to Taiwan when they felt necessary. That was in that agreement. I suggested and implored Tedros that he sent his you know, members of his, his uh, Pacific you know, Asia team to Taipei early during COVID to see how they were responding. They refused. Um, but it's those types of things where it, we're not even trying to fight for new rules or having to win a vote, which we should continue to do. But also there's smaller ways in which we can just push the promotion of uh, Taiwan in these areas. I think at the ITU in particular, um, the ITU, I mean, 
it's not just participation of Taiwan as a political point. Half the time when I was talking with other delegations, it's about, they, it's an island democracy of 24 million people that matter, that have a lot of expertise that are important to the topic. My God, the issues of information technology right now, Taiwan is a global leader and should be a pr loud voice in the ITU on these important issues. So I'll, I'll stop there with some of the answers. Um, I, I'm so glad that you bring up uh, Manfred Nowak, um, and I think also about Theo Van Boven and some of the other special rapporteurs who did incredible work to document Chinese human rights violations either um, after they were allowed into China or after they were blocked. And I think that it is really extraordinary that um, they that these these folks really were very brave in doing that. They had strong support from the United States government. This was at a time when, in the United States, um, the United States delegation to the Human Rights Commission would continually work either directly or with allies to bring up resolutions on China's human rights violations. Even though we knew they were going to lose, we would continually bring them up and work hard. And we didn't just assume, you know, even though we knew that we weren't going to have enough votes to win the vote, we kept bringing up these resolutions year after year because we felt like it was the right thing to do and it was important to put these things on the record and to force countries to vote and to force China to answer for these behaviors. We only stopped doing that after both the United States and European countries started to engage in these bilateral human rights dialogues with China and we then moved all of our conversations about human rights into those bilateral conversations and away from the multilateral um, forum. This was a betrayal that we committed of our own commitment to, bio, to multilateral solutions on human rights and to universality on human rights. So we need to take responsibility for that. I think that the other thing that we, that we need to be concerned about, for instance, it's not just that China is sitting on the Human Rights Council, but there is now a Chinese national supported by the Chinese mission in Geneva who sits on the committee that decides who the special rapporteurs are who are the special procedures. They now have a role in selecting those people. So if you think that they've been able to intimidate the special procedures up to now, wait till you see what they do with the member of the committee that selects those people and how that helps them to winnow out anybody who might ultimately be critical of them. Because they have now recognized that even when these people don't go to China, they still have a power to criticize them and use their voice. And, they, and some of these special procedures have been incredibly brave in leading the fight on, on the Uyghur issue and on other issues with China, including on Tibet. And so I think that this is something, how we allowed this to happen together with our allies is something that we really need to, you know, I want to see the hot wash on that and the after action on why this was allowed to happen, because this never should have been possible when you have a country that won't allow special procedures in to have them be choosing special procedures. That's just insane to me. I think it's indicative also of the goalpost moving with the UPR that you talked about that keeps going on. China always talks about how China, there shouldn't be bilateral, um, there shouldn't be country resolutions in the Human Rights Council because that's what the UPR is for. This is a constant refrain that they that they put forward in, in the HRC, that we shouldn't be doing country resolutions, that's why we have the UPR. And then in the UPR, they manipulate the UPR, they fill all the seats with gongos, with Chinese gongos, so that no critical civil society people can speak. They make sure that all of the slots on the country speaking um, register are filled with their allies, with human rights stalwarts like Cuba and Iran and Syria speaking on behalf of China. And this is, you know, if this they are perverting these processes even as they are claiming to be the defenders of them. But again, without any consequences, this is going to keep happening. And so we've got to figure out what are the consequences and we've got to be willing to pull the trigger on them. Thank you. Sure. Th thank you so much. Uh, just a few points. I think the example that Kelly gave of norm shaping and asserting the idea that Xi Jinping thought and values would not be acceptable in UN re resolutions and progressively pushing that point to the point where 
The Chinese no longer asked for that, and the people sponsoring or chairing the proceedings over the resolutions knew that it was going to be uh, out of bounds. That's, an, a, I think, a powerful example of what engagement can achieve, and it takes a lot of meetings and a lot of presence and deep relationships, but that is the way that the United States, I think, you know, above all, is gonna be most effective in pushing back. I think when it comes to the UPR and the ways in which that process is being perverted, it's a matter of exposing that and working with civil society organizations, media organizations, to shine a spotlight on how that, what that process was intended for, how it's being used, examples of where it can be uh, successful and effective, and examples of whether it's really being turned inside out uh, increasingly, because that is a deep concern. This is intended to be a mechanism of accountability. When the United States, I was involved when the United States did our first presentation to the UPR, and we convened a uh, kind of shadow UPR comprised entirely of civil society organizations, where we invited civil society organizations from the United States and from around the world to do their own proceeding uh, at the Palais in Geneva and talk about our record. And we had a panel of US officials who had a give and take with them as a way of modeling the way that we engage with civil society organizations in our own country and to demonstrate our transparency and try to elevate the bar in terms of the, how the, United, the, the UPR would be approached henceforward. And I think that's an example that uh, bears repeating an elevation in that system. And then finally, just to touch on uh, you know, the idea of reporting on countries' records in the multilateral arena in State Department human rights reports, I do think more linkage between countries' approach to human rights issues at the United Nations and the bilateral relationships is key. One of the key, most valuable tools that we were able to bring to bear was that bilateral uh, leverage and the integration of our concerns at the United Nations uh, in our bilateral dealings in capitals uh, and sometimes here in Washington with those governments so that they understood this was not just a sideline issue being pursued in Geneva, but was real, rather a major US priority. Uh, to that point about bringing some scrutiny, we did do a hearing, I chaired it on February 1st on the China Commission. Yes. We called it the PRC's Universal Periodic Review and the real state of human rights in China. And uh, we had excellent witnesses uh, and the whole idea behind it was to bring bite and scrutiny to a very much of a flawed universal periodic review. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for your tremendous insights. Like I said before, you know, I think there is a bit of a sticker shock, stick, sticker shock on some, that we are now at $18 billion in 2022. I'm not sure what it will be in 2023. Uh, and, um, you know, you compare that to China, <laughs> which is about $2 billion total uh, assessed plus voluntary, and $15 billion of ours is all voluntary. I mean, the assessment for WHO, for example, something order of magnitude of about 115 million, and we gave them over a billion, half a billion. So there's, you know, I hope there's strings coming with that. I hope there's there's an effort to, to like you say, promote real reform and, and transparency. Uh, I'm not sure about that. That would be a, a reason for another hearing, I think, uh, and for some requests uh, of the administration. But I can't thank you enough for this. A testimony, and um, unless if you have anything else anybody would like to add before we close, then the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.